All right, welcome to the crowded lecture. This is um, lecture two today for players 1400 and or higher plus tax. Okay, people just coming in and out. It's Grand Central Terminal here. Notice I said terminal. That was the post office. Okay, so um, the, the, the throngs of players here said they wanted to see classic games, but I like to show relationships. So first, we're gonna uh, watch the movie starring Lady Gaga and, oh wait, we're not gonna do that. That was last night. <clears throat> um, a Star is Born. This will be the a Chess Star is Born. Now, you're all familiar with the two games I'm gonna show you, except for those of you that aren't. And those games, obviously, frankly, are Raueli Rubinstein and Aronian Anand. Aronian Anand used to be good, but today they're playing in Isle of Man and the truth hurts. Yeah. Okay, so Rubenstein, many consider the greatest, second or third greatest player who never became world champion, along with Korshnoi and Kerez. Okay, those are, the, those are the big three. And Rubenstein was playing in the early 1900s, and as you know, he, he doesn't know. That means uh, when I was living in Belgium, before you were born, you were born, um, I met his son, Sammy Rubenstein, who was very old, and now is not no longer alive, because that was 30 years ago. So, But I did meet Rubenstein's son. Okay, now in this game, uh, black one, so we'll flip the board to avoid confusion. The opening play, eh, they wouldn't play like this now. This game was over 100 years ago, so give them a break. Okay. So sort of boring and symmetrical. Now they would play like this now, this is okay. D takes C5, nobody would develop their opponent's bishop for free like that. Okay, and B4 makes sense. Bishop B2 makes sense. Okay, this position was the first move where if it was a grandmaster game today, there's like a 0% chance this move would be played. It's the move queen D2. Why did he play queen D2? I don't know, but I have an idea. I think um, unlike what he did previously, where he took on c5, I think he believes black is gonna take on c4, he believes correctly, and then white's gonna take on c4, but white doesn't wanna play bishop e2 and then take on c4, when he can just do it in one move. So he's like, all right, queen d2, maybe rook d1, and I'll, I'll take on c4 in one move. Okay, queen e7, and this is a pawn sacrifice, which seems to me too dangerous to capture. So, for example, white could, you know, take all of this. Yeah, this seems like with the king on e1, um, I wouldn't do this. In fact, I wouldn't be surprised if knight takes b4 was a good move. This looks like I don't want to play white. Oh, I'm too scared. Okay, computers like white's winning. I don't care. But, all right. Um, with white playing queen to d2, losing a tempo and not castling, and not able to castle, one sacrifice is pretty reasonable. Okay, white decided let's castle, bishop to d3. That's a good idea. We'll try to hide the moves from the onlookers. And now Rubenstein took. And this was actually very funny. b5, rook d8, the queen moved away from the rook, and bishop b7. The reason this is funny is after white castled, you'll notice this is the same position for both sides. With one small detail, Black's rook is on d8 instead of f1 on f8. So Black has a free move. Also, it's Black's turn. So basically, if the rook was on f8 and it was White's turn, that would be just the same. Right, Anthony? Okay. Yeah. Okay. If this was on f8, that would just be like the same. Everything's symmetrical, and therefore it should be white's move, because it's white goes first in chess. However, black's played rook d8 and it's, and it's black's move. How did this happen? The answer is white played queen d2, queen e2. Also, black took on c5 before, white took on c5 before black moved his bishop, and black took on c4 after white moved his bishop. This gives black two tempi. So we have the same position 
is that black gets two moves ahead. So what black should do to be fair and equitable is black should play rook f8, bam. And then it's white's turn in the same position. No, I shouldn't do that. Okay, now, when people ask me, and this happens all the time, how come in this game, like this guy didn't play very well? Like, why did that happen? And the answer is always the same. It's always the guy you haven't heard of. So when people play really well, every move, every game, you've heard of them. Kasparov, Fisher, Karpov, Carlson. When you're like, wait, why'd that guy make that move? I don't understand. Then it's guys you haven't heard of. Okay, well, that's... The better you play at chess, the more people have heard of you. Now, if you want to know who was better between two strong grandmasters, the best way I believe, why look at their rating, is to look at their Wikipedia page and see who's is the longest. Okay? Paul Morphy's a famous player. His Wikipedia page is pretty long. Gary Kasparov was a good player. His page was pretty long. Unfortunately, I have a Wikipedia page. It's not too long. Okay? It says, Ben's teaching a couple people in a class now. That's what it says. <laughs> exactly. Crying in my coffee. Okay. Rubenstein played, played knight e5. Rawr! Attack. And they traded. And f4. He was afraid of black's bishops. So he's like, let's block your bishop. Now, this does something confusing to the class, but that's not my fault. This is the 1400 and over class. The fact that neither one of these are over 1400, I'm innocent. Okay, this weakens a diagonal, which doesn't make sense to either one of you. You're like, what's a diagonal? What's weakens? What's this? Okay, right? Anthony's like, what? Okay. I don't want yeah, so in this position, the diagonals that I showed you, that looks pretty good for black. Now, this diagonal is sort of blocked. However, this diagonal is now open. Okay, the white king's on that diagonal, and there's a weak pawn that used to be totally defended. So black's like, I can go to a different diagonal, it's okay. Goes back here. White plays e4, looks pretty good. Rook c8. It's like when a non-played rook c, but I haven't showed you that game yet. You showed up slightly late. I'm showing you two games that are related. One was played five years ago. One was played 111 years ago. Okay. E5 attacking the knight. Bishop b6 check. Now black's working on these two diagonals. King h1, obviously. Now there's a term that you know, but that you don't because you're a kid. So you don't work. Overworked. You're like, I don't work. I, I play three video games at once. I'm overworked, right? I don't play video games. Ah, oh, just like in the last class. In the last class that you missed, there was a girl here. There were many girls. And one of the girls said, I don't play video games because I'm a girl. Girls don't play video games. No. And I was like, what? The other girls protested. Yeah, they said, where's my video games? Yeah. Okay, so the queen is overworked because I said so. Um, Notice the rook is attacking the bishop and the queen is defending the bishop. You agree? Yeah. So that means if the queen goes somewhere, I'll take the bishop for free. Yay. So he played knight to g4. And he said, you can take my knight, then I'll take your bishop. Or you could not take my knight and I'll play queen h4 and you'll cry like a grandmaster. Man, black has a lot of peace, a lot of doing that. Okay, so white played bishop e4, and he's like, you can play queen h4, we're going to trade all the pieces off, we'll agree to a draw, it'll be great. And white said, uh, black said, I'll threaten checkmate. Now, white played the move g3, which obviously would be illegal if the bishop was back on d3, that would be check. Also, the annotator of the game is suggesting the move h3 and then showing why it's not good. If we go back and let's say white plays random legal move and then white plays h3, we take on h3 confusing the audience. Are you confused or you agree? Okay. Yeah. Now the pawn's pinned so the game's over. It's checkmate. Yeah. Black wins. So the move bishop e4, which white played previously, that allows white to play h3 or g3, 
and it's not illegal and hanging mate. He played G3. Okay. Then he attacks the queen. He knew black would move his queen away. Well, if black moves his queen away, then white takes this bishop. So probably he thought black would play bishop, takes bishop, check, and then move the queen away. Okay. But Rubenstein's like, I have a better idea. Let's make this the most famous game ever played. Right? Now, when you sacrifice all your pieces and mate your opponent, usually there's a reason. And the reason isn't, I like doing that. The reason is you have more attackers than they have defenders. On the king side, this looks pretty good. This looks good. These look pretty good. This one's coming in here somewhere. These pieces, eh, eh. That's not good defending. Also, I teach my students, don't move pawns in front of your king. And white's like, let's move all the pawns in front of my king. Let's open that king up. Okay, so black played, rook takes c3. Why did he take the knight on c3? Because the knight on c3 is defending the bishop on e4. Bishop takes e4 is almost checkmate. Almost. It's not because there's a white queen on e2. But we can get rid of the white queen on e2 also. Okay, now, if white plays a normal move, and just says, well, I'll take the rook. He just gave his rook away. Now the queen is overworked again. The queen defends the bishop, and it defends mate. So I take the bishop with check, and then I mate you. So he played. Pawn takes queen. Makes sense. Now remember I told you bishop takes bishop would be mate on e4 except for that silly queen. So he played rook to d2. He's like, move your queen away from your bishop so I can play bishop takes bishop mate. And then white said no talking. Now, let's say white takes all of black's pieces. Let's say he takes this one, and then he takes this one. Then checkmate. Right? So he's like, fine, if you want to give your rook on d2 away, fine. Then he takes the rook. Bishop takes bishop check. And it's not me. And white said, you know what? You gave all your pieces away to mate me. I can give my queen away. You give your queen away. Why can't I give my queen away? Okay. And if black says, yeah, I'll take your queen. Now, white's ahead in exchange. White has a rook for a knight. And if black says, I could win a bishop, white can say, what about your knight? So white's ahead material. I don't think white's better here. White's king is no good, but okay, the game goes on. So white was saying, if you can give all your pieces away, I can give all my pieces away. And black had a better idea. Instead of winning all of white's pieces, he'll checkmate him. And this is the most famous move of the game. I'm sure you all know it from previous lessons. Anybody? Or you can just figure it out. How does black checkmate white? It doesn't take very long. Rook F7. Rook F7. This is F7. Oh. Yeah, so that move would be illegal. Also wrong. What move did you mean? Uh, exactly. Rook C. Oh, Rook C2? Yeah. That's actually a very good move. That move wins. Good job. Okay. He played a more exciting move than that. Much more exciting. But I like your move. The idea behind your move is if he takes the bishop, it's checkmate. But he actually threatened Rook H2 mate immediately. Confusing the audience. What move can black make threatening rook h2 mate? Rook h3. Rook h3. That threatens rook h2 mate, because I said so. You see how rook h2 is mate? There's no defense to that. But he still defended it. He resigned. That stopped it. Right? Now, when I tell my students to attack with all of their pieces, I think black did a good job. I, I think that's all of his pieces. Conversely, yeah, yeah, you know, come on. And then I assume it's like made in two or three, I don't know. 
Okay, mate in three. If White plays great, he can get mated in three. If he doesn't play great, it's going to be one or two. Okay, so that was a very famous Rubenstein game. And even though today grandmasters in general don't know a lot of old games, they know a lot of new games, usually they know the classic games. Like this one, Steinitz von Bartleben, the opera game, Kappa, uh, El, uh, Botvinnik Capablanca, AVRO 38, etc. mainly, etc. And there's more. I could name more, but, you know, I'm not the one on trial here. And if you talk about those games, they know the ideas of those games, and they've seen them. Maybe they didn't memorize them. I've memorized some of those games, some I didn't memorize. Now, in 2012 and or 13, I think it was 13. It was in January, so it's the same thing. There was the famous game Anand Aronian, which coinc Aronian Anand, which coincidentally I was doing live commentary for for chess.com at the time. Okay? And this is something, this is the residual of other analysis. I'll give you an example. You, let's say there's a disease and people are dying. And the doctor says, I cured that disease. And then nobody dies. And he's like, what? I'm the doctor. Rawr. And they're like, how'd you cure that disease? It's about 50-50. He was trying to cure another disease, but he cured another one by accident. He's like, I was trying to cure that disease and it didn't work, but what I did cure is this other disease. Great, right? That happens a lot. Okay, this could happen to you. You're trying to do something. What you're trying to do doesn't work, but you do something else. Also good. Okay, so sometimes you do preparation for your opponent, and your opponent doesn't do that. And you're like, darn. For example, you have a friend. His name is Bill. And you're like, man, I'm going to crush Bill. Bill always plays E4, and I'm going to play my secret weapon that I've analyzed for hours. And then you play Bill, and you're like, <laughs> and Bill plays knight F3 on move one. And you're like, what? I prepared hours for E4, and you're furious, right? Now, five months later, you play Joe, and Joe plays E4, and you play your Bill preparation, and Joe goes right into it, and you crush Joe. Okay? Okay. That happens in Grandmaster Chess all the time. You prepare for one guy, that guy doesn't do what you want, but then somebody else does. Then you crush them. Okay, That happened to me. I don't do a lot of prep. I prepared for hours and hours and hours for Ray Robson. I played him a match. He didn't play the stuff I prepared in that line. And then the next week, I went to the Chicago Open, and I played a 2400 player, and he played all that stuff. So I moved everything instantly, and I moved 23. I had used like 10 seconds, and he had a minute left for the rest of the game. Okay, And then I had to pick him up at 3.30 because I took him to school. Okay, Then he had no pieces left. So the preparation didn't win the game on the board, but I had all my time, and he had a minute left. The position was complicated. I'd already analyzed it. Okay, That's what happened here. That's why I told you all of that. As you know, well, you know in the back, I don't know if he knows, Anand played many world championship matches, and he was world champion five times. He beat Kramnik, he beat Topolov, he beat etc., mainly etc., he beat Gelfand, okay, and, when, and he played Carlson a couple times, and when he played those matches, he had lots of preparation, and then sometimes that preparation didn't happen, but then... He would play another tournament, and the guy would walk into his world championship preparation. That's good preparation. When you're ready to put the world championship on the line, those moves are pretty good. Analyze with supercomputers. Okay. Don't do that. Now, Aronian, unfortunately, walked into a nonce preparation. I think it was with Gelfand. I think this is Gelfand preparation. Like Gelfand in 2012. Yeah. Okay, so Anand looked at this a year ago, and then he didn't get to play it, and then Aronian walked right into it. Okay, it's like his Bill or Joe. Okay, so they played some kind of Slav. Notice the opening's different than the last opening, but it doesn't matter. They get the same kind of position. 
they fee and cattle their bishops. Well, black did. Okay. Now, in this position, white just played knight g5 because white just played knight g5. And most people would be scared because look at the white pieces attacking h7. Aren't you scared? Should be. Okay, and Anand's like, I prepared this for Gelfand, and I prepared the move c5. Now what's funny is, white played, knight takes h7. If white plays bishop h7, and you take it, that's checkmate. That's not good preparation. But would Anand take the bishop? No, he'd play king h8. Okay, and the game goes on. This is his preparation. Aronian played knight takes h7, knight g4. Both sides checkmate each other. That's fair, right? Now, if you remember the last game, Rubenstein had these bishops here, and he played knight g4. Okay? Now, if it was black's turn to move, black would play bishop h2 check and queen h4, and white would cry. So Aronian played f4, blocking the bishop. And Anand took on d4, and he played e takes d4. And now Anand writes 5,000 paragraphs about whatever. And he says, I prepared this for my world championship match, rawr, etc., mainly etc. And then he played a move you would never in your life think of ever. Of course, if you prepared it for hours with other grandmasters in an engine, you might think of it, because it told you. He played, pay attention, bishop c5, confusing the audience. The idea is obvious. We want to play bishop takes d4 check. Okay, if you take my bishop, seems reasonable, I take your pawn, and I have two threats. I'm threatening your bishop, obviously. If you save your bishop, I'm going to play queen d4 check, for example. Queen d4 check. Knight f2 check. And now we threaten queen g2 mate, bishop g2 mate, and queen e1 with mate. So white didn't like that for some reason. Okay, now this will really confuse the audience. It'll even confuse the adult in the audience. It'll really confuse you. You'll be like, whoa, can I leave the class now? I don't want to hear this. In this position, Aronian thought for a long time. He thought longer than probably any game you've ever played on this move. He thought 50, five zero minutes. Yeah. He thought on this move. In my opinion, he didn't even see his opponent's next move. He played bishop e2. He's like, um, I want to take that. That's very annoying. Okay? And Anand made a move that I'm guessing Aronian didn't even look at. That's how complicated the game is. Knight D E5. Unleashing the latent potential. So Anand's like, I would like to play Queen takes D4 check. And Aronian said, no talking. Now watch this checkmate that I made up. Takes. Check, check, and then checkmate. Okay, now after knight e5, here comes queen d4 check. That looks pretty dangerous, right? Okay, now you'll notice this whole game, white's pieces aren't really well coordinated. We got the rook and the bishop haven't moved yet, and this knight's over here by himself. Black is checkmating white like Rottweil Rubenstein. Same kind of me. Okay. Uh, uh, Aronian played bishop takes knight. That's why he played bishop e2. Bishop takes pawn check. And knight takes g4. Okay. Anand wrote, here I kept thinking of Rottweil Rubenstein. That's what you guys think when you're playing. Okay. And this looks just like it. Look at the bishops on the diagonal. Look at the knight on g4. Look at the queen coming to h4. Very similar. Okay. So Aronian 
played an amazing defensive move that doesn't look like a defensive move. He took the rook. Now I have a question for the class. If black plays the obvious move, queen h4, Notice black is threatening queen h2 checkmate. You can't play g3 because it's illegal. If you play h3, we just talked about that last game, checkmate. We looked at that checkmate last game. So after queen h4, how does white stop mate? Now, in the opera game between Morphe and the Count and the Duke, at the end of the game, when there was like three moves to go, those guys were like, hey, Morphe's checkmating us. Let's trade queens. And they tried to trade queens, and Morphe sacrificed his queen. So the truth hurts. How does white trade queens here? He can force the queen trade. Queen h7. Queen h7 check. And then we trade queens. And now black doesn't get checkmated. Okay. Now Anand wanted to play queen h4, but he didn't want white to play queen h7 check and trade queens. So he played f5. Now queen h7 is incredibly illegal, right? Now here comes queen h4 and mate. Here it comes. It's coming. Okay. And Aronian's like, I can stop queen h4. Like g6, I stop queen h4. Good job. Okay. Queen f6. Now, if the knight moves away, then you know, queen h4 is annoying. So he played h3, which does nothing. Nothing. So he just took the knight. And he said, why don't you take my knight? That seems pretty safe. And Aronian said, no talking. If you take the knight, then I got queen h6 mate and queen h7 mate. So that's not a good move. Okay. So Aronian played queen e2. Queen h5, threatening the aforementioned queen h3 mate. Again, just like in Rottweiler Rubinstein, we have the same attacking force. And in Rottweiler Rubinstein, Rottweiler's bishop was on b2 doing nothing, and the rook was on a1 doing nothing. Now we have a very similar doing nothing. Now I want to yell at everybody at home. Everybody at home says, Morphy was no good. His opponents couldn't defend. Today's players defend really well and don't play like that. What? Aronian's number two in the world was, was 28-30 feet A. That's how he defends. He loses with white and 20 moves to an attack. So what are you guys talking about? Ridiculous. Okay, now Aronian doesn't want to get mated in one move. So he stopped queen h3 mate. Queen d3, not a good move. He's losing anyway, but that's a really bad defense. Now, if Morphe was black, they would say, oh, queen d3, Morphe's opponents can't defend. If only Aronian was playing. Well, Aronian was playing. And he played queen d3, which is terrible. Now everything wins. The reason it wins is something you've never heard of. That means they've probably heard of it. Called interference. He's like, I've heard of it, but I don't know what it means. Interference means your piece is doing something, but I interfere with it. Okay, so what's the queen on d3 doing? It's defending h3. Otherwise, queen h3 mate. So how do we interfere with the queen? So it doesn't go to h3. There's two possible answers. Either one's right. What's that? Bishop e3. That's what he played. Also, knight e3 works, but bishop e3 is better. Yeah. Now I'm threatening queen h3 mate, because I said so. Yeah. If I turn the engine on, the engine stops mate by giving all of white's pieces away and says black is like plus 17. If you're a human, it's very hard to stop mate. It's hard to give all your pieces away and stop mate. Only an engine can do it. You lose all your pieces. But you stop mate. But you lose them all. Now, this is very similar to the Rottweiler Rubinstein game for obvious reasons. Okay? And Anand knew that game when he played this game, so he did his 15 moves of prep with the Gelfand match, 
And then the last eight moves was like, hey, this is like that other game. Rar, Queen H3, May, Rook H3. This should be seven. Now, what's funny is when I talk about Anand and I talk about his bishop on B7, I'm not talking about this game. Okay, there was a game he played Topolov in the last game of their match for World Championship. And they had an equalish type position. And Topolov's like, hmm, if this game ends in a draw, we go to the rapid playoffs. I don't want to have rapid playoffs with Anand. So he made the game interesting, and then Topolov got mated. Because that bishop on b7 was killing him. Okay, that bishop on b7 is really good against the castled white king, right? That's a good bishop, okay? We don't get to have that bishop so often. That's why Anand played the move c6, c5, getting out of the way of his bishop. Okay, and even though that game was 23 moves, I don't see Aronian moving his rook and his bishop. Who's his chess coach? I don't know. Exactly. This guy's like, what? Aronian's no good. Okay, when, if I show you a Grandmaster, then I show you all the games they lose, looks bad. If I show you all the games they win, looks good. They do both. So you have to look at all of their games, then go, hmm, okay, those guys are pretty good. But when they lose, it doesn't look good, especially when it's a famous game. And a lot of famous games have ideas, we steal their ideas, then we play our own games. And we're like, oh, this was like that other game. Now, speaking of stealing, let me show you my greatest stealing. Don't tell the cops. Okay. I was playing, hey, he's going to tell the cops. Dang it. I was playing a game in a simultaneous exhibition. And what game does this remind you of? What famous game? I talked about it in class. This is a famous game. You all know it. He's like, I do. It's the opera game. It's Morphe versus the Count and the Duke. It's such a famous game that if I go to the internet and type in the opera game, then this game pop up. Okay. Now, after knight f6, which is the losing move, Morphe played queen b3. Notice we're attacking f7 and b7. It turns out about... 17 years ago, I had this position. I was giving an exhibition. I was playing like 20 people at once. My opponent, he saw queen takes b7, but he didn't see this other threat. In the famous game, Morphe game, they saw the mate and they stopped it. My opponent played b6. I took and I played mate. So basically, I stole all of Morphe's moves that my opponent hung mate in two. Great. Chess is easy. Okay. I knew the Morphe game. Obviously, my opponents did not. My opponent did not. I played B6. He's like, who's Morphe? Okay. Now, when I was a kid, a friend of ours, who I talked about in the previous lecture, with the knight D3 mate, he would come to our house occasionally and play my dad blitz chess. And we'd feed him sometimes. And he asked my mom, does Morphe still play in tournaments? And my mom's not a chess player. But she knew Morphe died over 100 years ago. So she was like, no, he died over 100 years ago. Okay? But he didn't know that because there was no internet then. So you either knew stuff or you didn't know it. If you didn't know it, you would all look on the internet and see what the answer is. You just be like, oh, well, I guess I'll guess. Okay. People still argue today when you can look on the internet and not argue. So, yeah. Like, obviously, the earth is flat because people all over, all over the globe believe that. No? You didn't get that? No? All over the... Yeah, okay. So the earth is flat. What are you talking about? Ah, these jokes are way over your head. But not too far over because the earth is flat. If it was round, it could be way over your head. Yeah. Does that make sense? So all your friends that you had in your life that you don't see anymore, they must have fallen off. Is that what happened? He wasn't in the last class. This is what the answer is fries. Right? Man, he's so confused. He's like, what's happening? Yeah, what world is this? So by knowing the classic games, you can play your own good games by playing the right moves and not playing the wrong moves. What are the right moves? The moves that were played previously that we've learned. 
And then we're like, wait, that guy always won, and those guys always lost. Let's play like that guy. Okay? Then we play better. Then people say, Morphe wasn't good. I play pretty good now. Well, you have the internet. You looked at Morphe's games. He didn't do anything. He got nothing. So based on having nothing and Morphe still playing better than you, you better watch your step. Okay? So what I do, I look at the classic games. I see what worked and what didn't work, and I do what worked. That's what all the grandmasters do. Now, because of the internet, we can look at games as they're going on. And when, in the 1980s, when I was getting better at chess, you know, when the magazine came out three months after the game, we're like, ooh, that game happened. What world was I living in? Now, as it's going on, 1,200 players with their ends, they're like, that move sucks. My computer said so. Now we can get better pretty fast. Okay. Now, before the lecture ends, since you wanted to see classic games, I want to show you a classic position. Exactly. Okay. To me, it's the most iconic chess move of all times. Right? I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Right? You, you guys know? L-E, and then we're going to marshal in the new game. Right? Okay. And definitely 1912, and definitely this opening. Okay. So this is the most famous thing that's ever happened ever. Right? You guys know what I'm talking about? Now you got nothing? Okay. In this position, material is equal because I said so. Right? Queen, two rooks, and a minor piece and five pawns. Obviously, black has a big threat. Rook takes queen. Okay? White didn't want to lose his queen, so he played queen g5. Makes sense. Okay, now, knight f3 check would win the queen, but there's a pawn on g2. So the pawn would take the knight. So Marshall's like, I have a good idea. Let's take that bishop. Then when he takes my rook, then I'll play knight f3 check. You agree. Okay, and the guy's like, hey, don't do that. And the guy played a zug. Instead of taking the rook, he attacked his opponent's queen. Exactly. Okay. And now Marshall played the most famous move ever. Everybody at home is screaming the answer, and you guys look really confused. And this game has, if you go to the internet and want to look the game up, it's called the Gold Coin Game. You know what I'm talking about? He does. He's like, yeah. Now... The reason there were gold coins is disputed. Some say the move was so good, they threw gold coins on the board. Okay, what probably what actually happened was people were betting on the game and they were paying. And they threw gold coins because they liked the move so much. I like this move. I wouldn't throw money on the board. Okay, I've pretended to do that whenever I see a brilliant move in the chess club, which is really rare. But when I do, I like pretend to throw money on the board like as a joke. I would never actually throw money on the board. All right, are you ready? It's the last move you would play. The last move you would play with black. The worst move on the board. You would never play this move. That's what he played. Queen F3? Close. Queen G3. Now you're making sense. Dang. Is that what you were going to play? Wow. And then white resigned, confusing the audience. They really are confused. You should see them. Turn the camera and show them. Okay, let's analyze. Black is threatening mate. So probably we should stop that. We take with this pawn, mate. If we take with the other pawn, check, mate. So that didn't work out too well. Let's take with the queen. Check, check. You can't take with H pawn, it's illegal. Can't take with F pawn, you get mated. So you play King G1, and now there's lots of ways to win. I could take your rook, or I could play Knight E2 check, and I'm just up a piece here, up a knight for nothing. I'm not sure if taking the rook is better or Knight E2. It doesn't matter, they're both plus six or something. Yeah. Now, Queen G3 is not the only winning move, but it's the coolest. 
Right, that shows your opponent who the boss is. Right, now by learning these tricks of sacrificing material with forced mate, mate is so much better than anything else. You can do anything. I'll give me an example. You would never take out your wallet and take out a $100 bill, if I had one. Where's my $100 bills? What's going on here? What kind of world am I in? What's, where'd they all go? Man, I can't do my magic trick because I don't have one. There we go. Okay, so you got a $100 bill. Now, if you said, would you please set that on fire? I'd be like, no. Also, I think it's against the law. I think so. Yeah. Okay, but let's say it wasn't against the law, and let's say the guy walks in and says, hey, I'll give you a billion dollars to set that on fire. Now I'm setting it on fire. And if it was against the law, I'm still setting it on fire for a billion dollars, right? Yeah, close the door. Okay, so I'm doing something crazy because the reward is much better than the crazy. You paying attention? If I said take your shirt off and throw it in the garbage and go outside in the cold, you'd say, no. Then I said, well, the guy's going to give you a billion dollars. Then you'd be outside in the cold with your shirt off. Okay, so the point is, you can do crazy stuff if the reward is good enough. And you're like, Queen G3, that's crazy. But the reward is checkmate, so it doesn't matter. Checkmate is checkmate. If you can checkmate your opponent, you can do anything. Then you checkmate him. Since checkmate is so much more important than everything, then, then you can look at every legal move. If they lead to checkmate, you play it. And the move might look silly, because you were told, don't give your queen away. You still do it, but you were told not to, okay? But you were also told, don't give bait and one away. You still do that too. And it's funny, you guys have a problem, which I don't have. It's not your fault. Your problem is you equate getting checkmated and losing your queen as similar. And the reason is when you lose your queen, you lose. Yeah. You're like, oh, I lost my queen. That's why I lost. If your mom yells at you and says, why'd you lose? You're like, I lost my queen. She doesn't say, you lost your queen. Well, then what happened? There's like, okay, you lost your queen. That's fair. Nobody says, why did you lose after you lost your queen? They're like, okay, you lost your queen. So you don't give your queen away because that's like losing. It's not like losing. Getting checkmate is like losing. Checkmate is so much better than taking a queen. If you realize that, you might sack your queen more because you do checkmate. But you're like, I never look at queen sacks. I hate sacking my queen, I always lose. But actually checkmate's a lot better than your queen. And the last story I tell before the kids tournament starts soon, I was playing a tournament in Michigan before you were born and I checkmated my opponent. And I was putting my chest set away and a guy walked up and asked me why I didn't play some other move. And I said, I checkmated my opponent. And he said, yes, but if you'd played this move, you would win the queen. And I said, checkmating is better than winning the queen. And he said, no, it's not. You just didn't see that. And then he walked away. In his mind, winning the queen was so important, nothing else mattered. So what's funny was he wasn't playing in the tournament. He was a spectator. Hmm. If he had played the tournament, he might have got checkmated a lot. They would have said, no, the game's not over. I didn't lose my queen. Right? You agree? Say no. no. Correct. Yeah, good job. Okay, so in conclusion, if you know your classic games like Rottweiler Rubenstein and Levitsky Marshall, you can do these tricks also. If you don't know anything, it's hard to do the tricks. If you've already seen them, that's easy. So when you play the kids' tournament today, make sure you do all that. And your opponent's like... What a dumb opponent. He gave his queen away. That kid takes your queen, then you make them. Yeah. Exactly. They just assume you gave your queen away. They love taking queens. So you can give anything away you want as long as you make them. They can do whatever you want. Okay? And that was recommended by T.I. That's where I learned chess from. I said, I can't do that. And what did T.I. say? He said, you can do whatever you like. The end. So you can give your king away? It depends. This tournament, maybe. <laughs> Oof, truth hurts. All right, save the recording. And then two, right?
Hooray! You didn't know you didn't know that Levisky Marshall? Mm -hmm. I saw him a long time ago. Oh yeah, long, yeah long, we, long Queen G three. I saw him before you were born, probably. Yeah, for sure. He's only forty, so I saw him before he was born. Yeah, that's true. All right, good job. <laughs>